We're going to uh, finish the fourth part of what sort of things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive. You still haven't got it. You're just believing that you receive. And you shall have. This is the fourth part of the fine part. The fifth part of the, the fourth part. Sub, sub fifth part. So we've been doing this for quite a while. And I'll, I, I'll, I'll print this whole teaching. And it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 pages. I'll print it for you guys when it's done. Because I'm adding to it and taking away and, and, and adjusting it. So I didn't want to put it out there. And uh, I have a question for you. And it goes like this. Who is your Isaac? If you don't know who he is, you will tonight. If I can say one thing, one thing that I see missing in the body of Christ. Now, there's other things, but this is the number one. Let me say it this way. The number one thing from my perspective at this moment that I could say was missing in the body of Christ. It's this. Who is your Isaac? Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 19 talks about that. Isaac was a kid who was born in Abraham's hundredth year. He was, a, he was a child of promise. God said, I'm going, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless all your seed. Well, how in the world is that going to happen? So did he miss the Lord? Did he really hear God? You ever had that question in your head? Did I really hear God? You know, just talk about that. Did I really hear God? Or what? Nothing seems to be working. Nothing. Everything I try, everything I seem to put my hand to, just falls apart, fails, falls down. Nothing works. Some of you have had a day like that or two. Some of you have had a week or two. Some of you had a month or two. Most of you had a year or two. Would it be apprehensive to say all of you have had at least a year or two? Or you just didn't think you heard from God? Would you think you're going to play tricky dicky with God? Or you just, you're, going, you're going to be that guy that gets at everything just Boom, shaboom, shaboom, zippity doo dah. Everything's just gonna fall off you, off the everything's gonna fall off the back of the truck and it's gonna fall right into your trunk while you're driving toward the truck. That that rut works, don't it? And that's how some of you think God works when you hear these messages. Now, a lot of Christians don't hear anything. So they're not even believing for nothing. So they, you know, it's like that isn't a big deal to them because they just go to, they, they just go there and they put their hour in, they go home. You're never challenged for anything. You're never believing something God said to you and then you had to wait 100 years for it. You didn't even wait five minutes. Let alone 100 years. I know it's like to wait 10 years. And the vision and dream that God gave me in 75, I'm waiting 45 years for some things. 
I'm still believing it. People say, well, why don't you retire, Doyle? Don't you have enough? I said, you're not, you missed the whole point of my life. I'm not into this to have enough. I had that 30 years ago. I'm into this because I want to fulfill God's plan for my life. And I'm not giving up till I get there. That's what it's all about. Abraham was waiting a hundred years because he knew God said something to him that had an effect on all of eternity forever. But do you think he felt like that all the time? Do you think those hundred years of waiting, he, oh, I always, man, I just had this positive thing going on. I mean, it, do you think that's what happened when Hagar come along? When, when Sarah said, hey, why don't you take Hagar over there and have a little fun and then we'll maybe use her to have this baby. Do you see really the, the, the problem with that? Before They got out of faith. That was really the problem with it. It wasn't so much what Abraham having relationships with Hagar and they have a baby. And then there was jealousy and bitterness and all kinds of crap come off of it. And the whole thing was all messed up. You know why? Because they simply decided they were going to get ahead of God. I've been believing for a car, but I've been, I ain't got no car. Bless God, I'm just going down there. The Doyle guy, he's been talking about borrow, not borrowing money. I'm just going to go down there and buy me a car. I don't care what he said. Well, help yourself. Tell me how that works about five years from now. When the thing's depreciated, the whatever, and you still owe on it. And you're upside down on it. Do you think these automobile companies care whether you're in debt? Do you think they care whether you're upside down or not? They don't care in New York second. They care about how many cars they sold this month. And they don't care what it takes to get you in one. They don't care what you have to do to get there. And they don't care how much you hurt five years from now because you did it. And they're going to accommodate you. Oh, we'll find a way. See, that's why I spend time counseling with our people when we, when we sell them a home. I want to know where they work, what they do. I want to know, have you got your budget set up? I won't even talk to them unless you do. Because I'm number one, I'm not going to let them steal my time. Because they just come in this, with this wishful thinking thing. And then they, all they do is eat up your time. I mean, I've had people come in here, and my gosh, you're, they're in such a disaster. They, they couldn't even buy the beat-up car they were driving if they had to again. They got themselves in such a mess because they, they violated the very thing I'm talking about, and that's the time that God gives you to do some growing up in your brain, not your body. Your body was pretty grown up by the time it was 16. You could have had kids and you could have surprised served the military, most of you, and have done about anything you want to do. But your body, your brain is your problem. You're immature. And it takes years to get your brain mature. It takes a long time. And what are you maturing it with? Education at the university. What the boys are talking about down there at the factory. And all that stuff. Well, there's some maturity to that to a degree. But it's nothing like what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a life of abundance that's supernatural. I'm talking about a life of health that's supernatural. I'm talking about a way of life that flies where the eagles fly. A, a, a way of life that lives above and beyond the storms of life. That's where they fly. 
They avoid those storms. They just It is avoided. Eagles don't fly through storms. Airplanes do. One was made by God. One was made by man. And I know there's a lot of people, oh no, God made that airplane. No, God did not make that airplane. Any more than the people at the Tower of Babel, God didn't make that tower. If he did, he wouldn't have destroyed it. Man does those things. Man has a great mind, man. He has the capabilities of doing anything that he perceives in his, in his mind. He can do it. I was listening to Leon Musk the other night, and he, he uh, I enjoy watching him. I enjoy his, uh, huh? It's Leon, man. Elon. Elon. Elon, yeah. And I, I enjoy his, his uh, uh, way he talks. I mean, he, 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 his brain is running so far ahead, and, and he, and he get, tries to get words out, and, he's got, uh, and his brain is like light years ahead of this person he's talking to, and he's trying to assimilate a word into something that makes sense to this guy. You know, he's just that one, one of those guys. But I like listening to him talk. And uh, he said, said the other day, he said, I know you people are really freaked out about nuclear power and oh, everybody's afraid of this and afraid about the bombs and the missiles. And he said, of the five things that are being developed in this world and in this country. Artificial intelligence is a hundred times more dangerous than the atomic bomb. What do you think of that? Wow. He's like Einstein. He's so far ahead in his, in his thinking. He sees... He said, they've got, they, they have a man now that plays chess, he said, that a, a year or so ago, two years ago, or whatever, three years ago, he could beat an old world champion in chess. Then a few months goes by, and then he could beat him in half the time. And they just keep up, upgrading this thing. Man, it's just doing this. You know, it's man with the mind of God without the control of God. Do you get it? Was he created in man's, uh, uh, was man created in God's image? Does he have the mind of Christ? He doesn't have the spiritual mind, but he has a capability mind. Because God said that about the men at the tower. He said they can get anything they want as long as they agree to do it. They can accomplish anything. How'd you like to be in a, how'd you like to be in a building made out of mud and straw and you're up about 5,000 feet up in the clouds and you have a heavy rainstorm? I thought about that so many times. It's unbelievable to think about that whatever they were doing, man, it, they were capable of making this work. Now, they did the pyramids, and those were made out of rock. So that's probably what they were doing with this tower. I don't know. So they're making it out of rock. They're figuring out how to get this thing done. Isn't that amazing? They still don't know how they did the pyramids. But he said this artificial intelligence, he said it's, it's advanced so much in the last few, couple of years that now they got a man that can beat the current world champion and can do it in like three minutes. He said it's scary. This is Leon, Elon Musk. 
and a hundred times more dangerous. What man can do with this? I read, I, was, I took my kids when they were little, must have been sometime in the early 80s. I took them up to the Henry Ford Museum. And I'm that guy that I'm inquisitive. Okay, so, so when I go through there, they're, oh, isn't that pretty, isn't that pretty? Oh, that's not, isn't that pretty? Oh, look at that, isn't that pretty? Is that pretty? Let's keep moving, come on, let's go. Isn't that pretty, isn't that pretty? But not me, man. When I find something over there, it's got a, a little glass walled case and it's got letters of Franklin Delano Roosevelt writing to, writing to uh, uh, Albert Einstein. Man, I'm interested in that. I wanna know what those guys got on their brain. And I read a letter that Albert Einstein wrote to some of his friends, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and, and uh, uh, who else were some of the friends? Uh, uh, Rock, or, uh, the, the famous men, Firestone. And uh, so there's like five guys that were really close friends of his. And he said, had I known, had I known, what man was going to do with this nuclear energy? Because he was the developer of it. If I'd known what they were going to do with it, I would have never invented it. Because in 1945, they took that bomb and they dropped it on uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima and just melted the people. That's 45 years ago. Or no. 65 years ago. Can you imagine what we have now? It's staggering. You can't, I mean, that's nothing. We have stuff now. Let me give you a little story. My son Justin graduated from college and, and uh, he was a mechanical engineer. And he got a job with Northrop Grumman in 2004, 17 years ago. That'll be 16 and a half years ago. And he went to work for Northrop Grumman in Baltimore in one of their plants. And being that he was on the golf team at Ohio State, the guy that recruited him said, I really wanted you to come here to work because we play golf tournaments against all the other factories in the Washington, D.C. area, and I wanted you on our team. But he was a good engineer. He was made some pretty good offers, but this one was a good one. Northrop Grumman is a big defense contractor, and he was going to work on their F-16 project, which was their main plane back in 04. Not anymore. So they were out on the golf course, and, and of course, they were going to play in a tournament, and Justin said, well, I can't, I can't get off work. I mean, I've been off work so many times, going playing golf. And, and, and his boss said, and this isn't the boss ahead of him. It's like a boss A to have ahead of him. He said, you're, you're getting off today. We're going to go play. I said, well, what am I going to tell my boss? He said, you don't need to worry about that. <laughs> off they go, playing the game. I said, how'd you do that day, Justin? He said, man, that'd feel really bad. I said, why? He said, well, I, we beat them. <laughs> and these were some great golfers in the Washington, D.C. area from other, Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin and, and, and McDonnell Douglas and all of them have factories, huge factories there because Washington, D.C. is with their money. They, got, they built a pipeline right into Washington, D.C., bam, and they all make billions. Just, just billions. They made a statement. They said, uh, Justin said, why do you guys hire so many of these young engineers? Man, the guys got the hundreds around here. Oh, he said, we don't care about that. We just filter through them. He just said, well, how do you do that? How do you, how do you afford that? He said, well, you know how much you make an hour? And he said, yeah, I make, he started at $25 an hour. Which wasn't turning the world on, but that's what they paid him. He said, do you know what we charge U.S. government for each of those guys? $375 an hour. 
See, I got some things in my head I really wish wasn't there. So now I'm going to put them in your head so I'm not the only guy. Because <laughs> that really bugs me. Okay, $375 an hour charge for a $25 an hour employee. So anyways, he was talking to this guy, and, he, and the guy told Justin they were coming back from the game and riding the golf cart, and, he, and the guy says, this is a banner, year for, or a banner day for us. And Justin said, why is that? He said, well, he said, one of our AWACS planes, that's that spy plane with the big dish on it, was flying over Baghdad. Picked up a signal from a, a source down in Baghdad. Sent the signal to the to a satellite that we put up in the air. Sent it to a a. Um, a uh, young uh, uh, officer in Colorado Springs to NORAD. The young officer picked up the signal, sent the signal, and we said that we developed the NORAD navigation or whatever that system is. So we sent it to, we sent that, that young officer sent a signal out to the USS Ronald Reagan, the our aircraft carrier that we had built. They put a special missile on the F-16 and we built both of them. The F-16 took off off the aircraft carrier, got up in the air, got 500 miles from Baghdad, released the missile, flew back to the Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier, the missile's now going toward Baghdad. The young officer picks up the missile off the satellite, off the AWACS, following the missile down to Baghdad. And that young officer in Colorado Springs, Colorado, guided that missile to Baghdad to a building through a window in the building, and we killed our target. Two thousand and three. You listening? He said, Justin, we're only using twenty percent of our technology. And Justin said, What is that? He said, It's all top secret. We can't talk to you about it. All that you heard me say was one-fifth of our technology that just Northrop Grumman has. You think man can't think things through? There's things out there that you guys have no clue. But God says, I want you to quit being a mouse and all you can see is the next blade of grass and I want you to start learning to fly like an eagle. And that's what I'm teaching you, because I'm teaching you what the Creator said about you. I've seen the miracles. Could that missile lay hands on the sick and they recover? Whew. Now that's technology a hundred times greater than anything they got. They've been spending trillions of dollars to figure out cancer, and all you need to do is lay hands on that person. What? Are you out of your mind? They got the greatest scientists in the universe working on cancer research. Have they got a cure? Is anybody out there? There you go. Thank you. 
How much money did that take? God don't need your money. He just lets you have money to encourage you. And, and he'll give you more than you could even imagine if you just be trustworthy with it. Don't use it to be Mr. Big. Or God had the latest, greatest in clothes and cars and houses and this and that and everything else. He's trusted me. Now he's trusted my children. Because you know why? I taught them. I'm taught them what I'm teaching you guys. I learned it in the quiet place, in my little closet, reading and studying, praying. And then I go out that day and I try something. And it, and it didn't seem like it worked. But I didn't go home and say, well, God, I'm not doing that no more. That don't work. I'm tired. I'm so tired of screwing around with this stuff. You know, nothing, nothing ever do works. Never said that in my, my, my whole life. You never hear it out of my mouth. Because the creator of the universe trained my heart. The creator of the universe trained my mind. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And how does the mouth speak? With your brain. So it's all tied together. It comes out of your heart, into your brain, out of your mouth. And if one of them is not trained properly, it runs into a wall and falls to the ground. That's why when you get born again, he gives you the new heart. Now he says, you got to train your brain. Does it not say renew your mind and prove that which is that good and perfect will of God? Where is that perfect will of God at? It's in your heart. He gave you a brand new one, just like him. And you know what? Most people go to the grave, and that's all that ever happens. They never learn to discipline their mind with what the heart's saying to them. How many times have I, I just got done talking to you about it? Have you not done something that you knew you weren't supposed to do, and you just did it anyways? That was the hearts of God speaking to an undisciplined mind. And he says, study. He says, renew. Go over and over. He says, meditate. Meditate on the word by day and by night. And observe to do everything that's written therein, and then you will make your way prosperous, and only then will you have good success. And that's not what most of you want to do. You want to have it your own way and help yourself. And all you will do is frustrate yourself, and you'll frustrate everybody around you, and everybody, everything's screwed up. Simply because you haven't disciplined yourself. People with their weight problems and on and on and on. It's you. The world's trying to blame it on, well, it's metabolism. Well, it's, you know, the way you were born. You know, it's the way you stand on your head in the morning. Lord knows what they'll tell you, and most of the people buy it. And the bottom line is, quit eating! It's going over in my mind here when we were sitting here. We ought to start, we ought to start this service at 6 o'clock and then have an hour, half hour of music. And then somebody can come and go. And, and it just, I heard, in my mind, I'm, I'm hearing people say, well, I got to go to, I have supper I got to go to. I gotta, well, you know what? Maybe you ought to just fast. Wouldn't that be a nice thing? Just cut the meal out. 
I cut my whole meal out all day just to come here to minister to you. It's time you grow up a little bit. Quit being babies, and you got to have your yada 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 your milk bottle all the time. Maybe you ought to just cut out a couple meals a day or a week. Just fast. Surrender it today, your day to the Lord. Say, Father, I'm giving you my body today. I'm just cutting it off, so I don't even want it to tempt me for nothing. I've been doing this for years. Whenever I want to hear from the Lord, I just shut it down. I said, body, you ain't dictating to me. You understand? You're not speaking to me. So you just forget about it. I want my head clear and I want my mind clear. I want to, I want to hear from God. I, I'm serious, man. I've got, I want to hear from the Lord. I'm not saying it's the only way you can do it because he that is led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, so you can be led. But getting that body out of the way, and get it's, it's noisy. Give me, give me, give me, man. I mean, I need a burger. Don't you understand? You got to get me down to the Big Mac. Put the, keep the money in your pocket and just tell your body you ain't getting one. Well, I talk to mine. Do you have a soul? Do you have a body? And it's the housing of your spirit. And your body's always in your way. It's always in your way. It's always telling you something wacko. And that's a great, that's a big discipline. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. When that body's dead, the soul has to leave. It needs a body to live in. Okay? And your soul and your spirit go together. So God wants us to be lean, mean, fighting machines. He isn't interested in artificial intelligence. He's interested in children that walk like he does. That's the world of the impossible, to walk like he does. If you're doing what everybody else is doing, you're not walking in God. Going to work every day at the factory is not walking with God. There's, there's some things involved there because he wants you to work with, you know, he wants you to be busy working with your hands, not being busy bodies. So there's, there's some things like that. But anybody can do that. Anybody can do most of this stuff. Anybody can carpenter. You just got to, you know, train yourself, right? So that's not the secret. The secret is to live in, in a higher level, in a place that's beyond what the world's doing. To have success beyond what the world's doing. I remember when I was building the home I live in. This was 19... It was the fall of 1990. And there's a, a group of Mennonites working downstairs doing my plumbing, my heating, and my electric. There's three different uh, groups of people down there working on those three things. And I remember walking in the house, and I'm looking around, and I'm doing what I'm training Caleb to do. And I'm looking around. I go to each of the rooms, and I see what's in there, and I... I do a little rotation in each room to make sure everything's the way I think it ought to be. And, and I had the print, et cetera. And they didn't know, the guys didn't know I was up there. And, and I heard them talking. And one of the boys 
great big burly, happy-go-lucky guy. Man, he said, this guy must really be rich. And I'm and I, and I heard that and I went, wow. Because see, to me, that's not where my head was. I was just this is my ninth home in 14 years because I had a plan. My first plan was fulfilled in my third house. I was debt free. I was 30 years old, totally debt free. And as a result of that, I never paid a house mortgage in my whole life. Do you understand? And I started at 26 with nothing but college debts because I had to pay my way through. And at 30, I was free. So now it's 1990, 10 years later. And he makes that statement. And now, of course, there's talk going on. I couldn't understand it. But I heard one guy say that. So I walked downstairs and I, I got down there and I looked big... I call him Jerry Berries, great big guy, about 275, 260. I looked him right in the eye and grabbed him by the collar like this. And I looked him in there and I said, hey. And he said, that's Mr. Doyle. <laughs> See, you don't intimidate anybody with your body. It's your mind yeah. that messes with people. Because I've never had any fear. Never. And I looked him in the eye and I said, I want you to tell me something. He said, what's that? I said, what's rich? Tell me what rich is. What is it? What is rich? Perception. It is your perception. Your satisfaction. It's compared to what? And I looked at him and I said, what's rich? And he said, well, gosh, Mr. Doyle, I don't know. I said, well, you said I was. I heard you say it. He said, well, yeah. You know, he's kind of like, you know, and I really like the guy. I said, would you, I'd be rich if I had $10,000 in the bank. He thought about it a minute. He said, no. He says, I don't think that would be rich. I said, well, how about if I had $25,000 in the bank? Would that be rich? And he said, he thought about it for a while. No, he says, I don't think that would be rich. I said, well, how about if I had 50000 in the bank? Would I be rich? And he looked at me kind of funny. He said, Mr. Doyle, he said, I think that's getting there. What do you think he said that? He's looking at his bank account. He didn't have 50, it's more than what he had, and he don't see himself rich. It's more than what he had. Do you know that if you live in, on welfare in the projects and poorest of the poor, and you hear gunshots every day, you are in the top 1% of the wealthy people of the world. You know why? You got running water and a toilet. Welfare money coming in. You can eat at McDonald's every day. You're living large, baby. Most of the world don't have that. So now, I just educated you. I just put your brain in a different level. 
Because the next time you hear the bull crap on television and all the, all the rhetoric and all the crap of they, they need this and we need to give this and we need to give more money, and we, you know that it's nothing but politics. It's not reality. It's whatever these politicians can get you to believe. That's how this election went this last time. I mean, I, I think it was crooked, but the bottom line is there were still a lot of votes on the other side, right? Both sides. Who were those people voting? What were they thinking? They bought a bill of goods. They listened to the rhetoric. I'm not even sure what they listened to as far as what the Democratic side was saying because the man was never out of the basement. He never said nothing. So they didn't know what he did or what he was standing for, but they knew all the negative that the press was saying against the other side, and they didn't like that. So they voted for this guy in the basement. Because they didn't like what all these news people were saying against the other party. There's nothing positive about any of that election except what Trump was doing and having meetings and getting people rallied and fired up. Huge crowds. Huge crowds. It's the same rhetoric that just went on with this, this, this rioting, or this quote unquote rioting in Washington, which wasn't a big deal. There was a million people there. There's only a small handful of people that did anything. There wasn't even a fire. And they have cities burning, but that's okay. Nancy Pelosi said, well, they're just expressing themselves. But Trump's responsible for all that. That was a horrible thing. One of the worst things that ever happened in the United States ever. And what was it? I don't, nobody even knows. See how perception is powerful? Deception. Yeah. Powerful. Yeah. Deception. Well, deception creates a perception. So bottom line, bottom line is Abraham was never experienced this before. There is no track record of this ever happening before. I wonder if he even had a track record of anybody talking to him about believing God. I don't know that it ever says that God actually appeared to him. It does say that an angel came out of heaven and said some things, but we don't know that the physical appearance was there, but we know the voice was there, but we don't know about the appearance. But here's Abraham. In verse 1 of 22, it says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt. And see, we, we read once again, one of the reasons I do my postings the way I do is because so many words in all, so many of these translations, it's like, man, I, I, I look at 27 translations when I study something, and it's like, man, these things are all over the place. And, you know, in 2020, a particular word means maybe a little different than it did maybe in 18 or 1469. I don't know. Probably there. Probably is true. But that's not what that means. God didn't tempt him. It says, it's, it's the Greek word NASA, N-A-S-A. It means to prove. So God was proving Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. We don't have any clue that he's seen him with the eye, but we know he was hearing it. Do you guys hear God every day? You better be. You don't need to have an audible voice. You got this in here, the heart. And it should connect with the brain. And when those two are in agreement, bam, it works. But if this is saying one thing and this is saying one thing or some other thing, you're in trouble. 
It's called not listening, not doing. And he says, yes. So God is proving Abraham. And, and the, word is, the word means that, you know, when I worked on the job, you two guys, I had a hammer. It was wood handled, my first hammer. It was called a plum. And I took duct tape and I wrapped it around the end of that handle so that I could hold the hammer with these two fingers because the more leverage I had, the more I could drive that thing. And when I frame a wall, I drive the spike in one swing. Not two, not three. One swing. And I learned that in Columbus building apartments, framing apartments. And the old timer that I work with, he said, You've got, boy, you need to get yourself a plumb hammer with a wood handle. And I said, well, those break, don't they? Oh, no. He said, that's what you need. He said, they're the most perfectly balanced hammer manufacturer. I mean, will I know? I wouldn't. I had a clue. But I bought one. And I learned to swing that that summer. Because that's all they had me do is pound nails. All summer. And into the fall. I pounded nails. And I pounded more nails. I had three guys and I did all the pounding. There's three other guys. There's a layout man and there was a, uh, um, a guy that did, did a lot of cleanup and carrying... You know, he drove a dump truck and picked up trash on in, in the job sites. And, and then the, the other guy was a, one guy laid out stuff and the other guy cut all the materials, getting it ready for frame. And then I carried there and I had to pound it up and put it all together. But I learned how to prove that hammer. I proved it. It was balanced and I, and I proved it. I, I didn't prove that it was balanced. I proved it out. I learned how to use it in a way that was significant. Therefore, I made a conclusion that it must have been balanced, but I was proving it to get the job done. And that's what God's talking about. He's proven, he's proven Abraham. He's, he's not testing him as, uh, I'm going to put that boy through a trial and he probably won't win. No, he's proving him. He's building his... He's building his character. His, he's building his strength, his power. Just like you prove yourself when you lift weights. You prove to yourself you can lift 250, 300. You've proven your ability. You're proving yourself. And God said, and he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou loves, lovest, and get thee into a land of Moriah. And then he said this to him. He said, offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee. Now God told him to offer him. Now what, what do you reckon this man was doing when you just got done waiting a hundred freaking years to have a baby promised to have 85 years ago. Now you're going to take this boy up the mountain and, and, and it says, and offer him there. What do you reckon is going on in the mind? I want to ask you something. Who or what is your Isaac? Have you believed for something? And I mean, you had to grit your teeth and wait a year, two, five, ten, only to have God say, now, now you, you, you got it available to you, I want you to give it away. You ever done that? Or do you just hoard it? Why? 
Well, you're never going to get anything, and God is never going to bless you because you're a hoarder. You're not a vehicle that God can use to be a blessing to the nations. You're nothing but a hoarder. All you can think about, you, your wife, your two kids, you four, and no more. That's it. And you're never going to get blessed. You're just going to spend the rest of your life scratching and denting and clanging and crawling and crawling begging and, and ho hoping and wishing. And, and I wish I did and wish that I had what the neighbors have. And I wish I could have got an education. And I wish I could have had of this. Or I wish I could have done that. And I wish I could have had all this stuff. And you're never going to have it. Because you haven't learned the foundational principle that God requires of us. He's proven you and you failed. He's asking you to do something and you did not do it because you couldn't figure out how you could take that money or take that situation or take that circumstance and give it away. Or let it go. It's not about the thing. It's about your relationship with God. It's about opening up your heart. It's about letting him prove you. It's about being in a position, putting yourself in a position where God can bless you. <coughs> you think coming to these meetings does that? Ain't gonna happen. No. All that I'm doing here is I'm teaching you guys to do the work of the ministry. I don't know what you guys do during the week. None of my business. God didn't call me and say, not only do I want you to tell them, I want you to follow them around and check, them, check up on them. That ain't my job. My job is to tell you the truth. And the rest of it's out of my hands. And I'll never be sad and I'll never be discouraged, and I'll never be defeated because of what you do. Because my mind is clear, and my heart is right, and I'm here to serve my Father. And in the blessing of being a servant to Him, He's asking me to be a servant to you. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and cl claved the wood for the burnt offering. <coughs> Claving is like you grab it and stick it under your arm. You know, and then you go and put it on the donkey and, you know, and tie it up. Clave the wood for a burnt offering. Don't you just love the King James? <clears throat> burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Then the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. This is number three, the third day. So he had three days to think about this, pulling a donkey. You guys never had to do that. He had three days to contemplate what he was told to do. And what was that? Go off your son. He just said that right here in the very first verse. And Abraham said unto this young man, to his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. He says, and, and come again. Well, wait a minute. That's not what God told him. Now, he's in all faith. God told him to go off of your son. And he tells those boys, you stay right here because I'm going to go yonder and I'm going to come again to you. And we are going to come again to you. Mm 
So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son, and took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went, both of them, together. Now you can imagine all the stuff that's going on in Abraham's head. The devil was real back then. You guys know that, don't you? He could speak to Abraham just like he can speak to you. He had already fallen. And he was alive and well on the planet Earth. So you can imagine the mind game that was going on in Abraham's mind. But here's a man that had learned discipline for a hundred years, waiting on a promise that God gave him. What promise do you have in your life? What is your Isaac? Do you have an Isaac? If you don't, you get your button gear and you get one. And you write it down. Write down your restoration, but, but f write down your Isaac. What is the thing you were believing God for? For the first 25 or 30 or 35 years of your life, 80 years, whatever. What is that thing? You given up on it? You quit? Abraham didn't. He got sidetracked a little bit. But Sarah was screwed up in that deal. I think Abraham was just having fun. That's why I read it. Because Sarah pushed it. And Abraham says, Woo, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, my father. And he said, here, here am I, my son. And Abraham said, behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb? Oh, no, the son said, uh, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? That's the son talking. So he's old enough to have a pretty good idea what he's doing. He's being totally obedient. Abraham is being totally obedient. This lad was not, you know, this lad was a full-grown lad. He wasn't a little guy. He was being obedient to his dad. And Abraham was being obedient. He knew what he was promised. He knew where he was at. Because he made the comment, me and the ladder coming back, we'll come back again. Now, he may not know how it was all going to play out. He just knew the ladder was coming back. Because he knew God ain't going to do that. But you know, I'm going to do exactly what he says. Because he wants to be seen obedient to the Father. That's what you guys need to do. You do every, does the Bible say you do everything hardly as unto the Lord and not unto man? Why does it say that? This, this principle. The blessing of Abraham. See, Caleb, you don't, you don't go out there in a job and, and, and well, I'm serving the oil corporation. Well, no, you are working there. You have a responsibility and you have, you have uh, things that you're responsible for. You know that you have commitments and responsibilities to God, but the key is you got to know that, you know what? you got a God that's watching over you and that has a bearing on how he's going to use you and whether you're going to ever get blessed. You go to work and you play on your computer all day and you're getting paid for that, you're never going to get blessed. Ever. My daughter works for the, for the <clears throat> government agency, and I was there this weekend in Washington, and she took us to Quantico. 
and that's the Marine barracks for the United States. All their special forces and stuff trained there, and that's where she trained 17 years earlier. And she now, she drove us in, and she's flashing the badge, yes, ma'am, go right ahead, and yes, ma'am, go right ahead. Now, these are military Marines guarding by four gates on this monstrous piece of land, probably a couple hundred thousand acres, probably big as, it's bigger than all of Lima, all of Elida, probably like a count, the county here. I mean, miles of roads inside the thing. And she, here we are driving through all this stuff and driving all the buildings and all, and all of a sudden we pull up to this building that must be seven, six, uh, 700 feet long. It's huge. She said, Dad, this is my building. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I run this building. I said, wow. So we're going to go in and I'm going to show you my office and show you around. All the top secret stuff in the FBI gets done there. And she's in control. You think your dad taught her something? She said, Dad, this is just one of 17 buildings I can run. I mean, where are they? They're buried here. Well, story goes on and on and on. There's some amazing things going on in her life. And so it's phenomenal. But she had a problem with the lady that's her secretary outside her office. griped and complained all the time, no, never anything right. Just a constant complaining that everybody's against me and yawn and on and on. Got so bad that they had to take her up to the bosses up, up, up above her, my daughter. And it wasn't toward my daughter, it was just about the whole place. And this lady is in a position in the government. They can't fire her without having major, major ramifications. So after all the hoopla and she doesn't come to work and she has this thing going on, that thing going on, my daughter has to put her back in the chair out from her office. She has to have the job back. Does the government have it together? Listen, you guys, every time, every time that I talk about the government, and I, I do it for principle here, but any time that I'm out there in my day-to-day -day and I talk about it, I'm wasting my time. Because all I did is get myself frustrated. Because how are you going to fix it? You got to do it grassroots. You got to pray. You got to get other people in office. That's how you got to do it. Or, or, or you're not going to have a, a free uh, enterprise system. You're going to end up with a dictatorship or something. But yeah, you just, I know a lot of you guys like to be a dictator. Bless God, you put me in that place. I'll straighten them out. Well, this country don't give much of us that kind of thing. You got to work through the system. Okay. It's not the best, but it's the best in the world. So understand, because I, I, I even put a comment in here about that, that uh, that if you have your heart totally focused on God, the government can't do anything to you. Nothing. They cannot have any bearing on your life because God's got a plan and he's going to see it through if you will believe him. He has a plan for your life.
But you got to know what it is. You got to be working towards something. And then a few other goals in between. Yeah, I know. And nothing can stop you. Not unless you start thinking about how everybody can. But if you start thinking about God, nothing can stop you. We're running a little late, but I would like to get through this. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And they came to the place which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven. So, see, we're not seeing things here. We're here. And said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand on the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God. It's the Greek word yari. It means reverent, fearful. And listen to this. This Greek word for fearest God means a sure sign of positive proof. Infallible proof to make full proof to fulfill. That's what that Greek word yari means, fearest. So see, if we don't study this thing, which is why I present my businessman's perspective the way I do, I, I give you a study tool. I'm not giving you, oh, I just, I had one guy say, well, why don't you just put about 15 or 20 words on there and give me a warm and fuzzy? I'm, I said, I'm not for that. You guys got 15,000 other guys out doing that. That's not me. I'm giving you a study tool because it says study to show yourself approved. The workman and they did not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You don't get the truth divided properly if you have a warm and fuzzy. You understand that? All that does is give you a warm and fuzzy. You can get that out of Bambi's book. Now I think they're saying that's not even right. Don't aren't they getting rid of aren't they getting rid of Dumbo and and all these cartoon characters because there's some kind of a Something, I don't know what it is. I don't even know. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing him talk about it. They're getting rid of all these cartoon characters because they're some kind of a... Yeah. They're, it's, I, I don't know what it is. I, I, just, I just hear my wife saying, man, they're getting rid of Dumbo. I said, I never walk with Dumbo anyways. <laughs> yeah, the elephant. Okay. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. But the key here, I I don't want to go beyond this right at the moment. The key here is make full proof. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to cut it off because there's so many things. There's only about eight more verses, but there's some really rich stuff there. Okay, I'm going to stop. I want to tell you this. Real quick, and this is over. 1997, I had a financial disaster hit me. It took me six years to get back on my feet again and get everything taken care of. Six years, but I never quit. Never quit. I had lawyers. I had every Tom, Dick, and Harry, every business person, you got to file bankruptcy. You need to get rid of that. You need. I said, no, nah, that ain't my way I roll. I said, I walk like Abraham does. Yeah, he made some mistakes. But I said, I'm, I think it's the way I roll. 
How's God going to get any glory out of that? You know what? I owe it. I'm paying it for it. If it takes the rest of my life. And that's what I told the Lord in 1997. If this takes the rest of my life, it's okay with me. I was 47 years old. Two thousand and three is gone, and I've been believing for a Harley Davidson. So I put cash aside. I got a bunch of Isaacs, and that's one of them. That Harley was my Isaac. I was believing for it for a long time, and I saved it during the hardest time of my life. That's the hardest, most difficult time of my life in the, in the business world. And, ah, man, you worked and you worked and you worked and you worked and you put a little there and a little bit more. And my, my office manager, she's putting it away for me and saving it. And one day, I said, I got a check. That's going to pay all my $5 million of debt. Or the last of it. Not all of it. I've been a big check. The last of the $5 million was the debt. More than five, but for easy figures. That's enough zero. I said, Robin, how much do we have in that account? She had. She said, you got enough money in that account to buy that motorcycle. I said, you're kidding. She said, no, you have it. The one that you wanted? Yeah. She said, it's there. Called them up, found out if it was available. Oh, they could get us one, yada, 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 yada. Bad the cash. That's my Isaac. I'm believing for that. That night I went home. And I'm turning on the television and I'm watching some Christian program. And I'm watching this program and I sat down about five and a half seconds and the Holy Spirit said, I want you to give that money to that ministry. But that's my Isaac, man. You're going to sacrifice my Isaac? How long is it going to take for me to get it back? That was my Isaac. I had a lot of them. That's why God trusts me. And if you ain't faithful in little things, you're never going to be made ruder over much. Because that's what the Word of God says. You just keep piling it away for yourself. That's God's way of, of giving blessing to you. Don't you understand? If you give, it'll be given to you. Hard measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Well, then give into your bosom. Are you kidding me? Do you believe that? Abraham was dealing with it. Did he believe it when he said, take your boy up there and sacrifice him for me? He took the wood and the knife. He just couldn't believe that that would happen. I think he had a plan on killing him and then God's going to raise him from the dead. That's what I thought or think. He's going to whack him. And then God was going to raise him up from the dead. That's why I believe he, he believed. But keep in mind, are you hearing God? Are you really hearing God? And when I watch that program, uh, do I get another opinion in here somewhere? That was my Isaac. I said, God, I don't want to stick a knife in that thing. You know what? When he tells you to do something, he won't ask you again. He ain't like you. Can I have this? Can I have this? Can I have this? Can I have this? God, would you give me? Would you give me? Would you give me? Can I have this? Can I? God, don't do that. He lets us just be yes. 
and there's no be no, and anything other than that comes from the evil one. Now, you can live with that, or you can go do your own thing. Help yourself. You've been told. Because when God speaks to you, he won't talk to you again. And you'll start looking, and the devil will give you more excuses than Carter's got pills not to do it. Well, yeah, it must have been a hunch. Must have been the food I ate tonight for supper, and it just didn't settle well. You know, I just got this thing going on. So I mean, it's just, you know, you know how you overeat, you go to bed, then you dream stupid dreams. Okay. Yeah, your body's talking to you again. Hello. I went to bed. Got up the next morning. Got myself cleaned immediately. I didn't even stay and have my devotional time. I flew to the office because she got in at 7. I said, get that money out of that account and do it right now and get it into the bank so I can't touch it. She said, oh, boy, you got something going on? Because she'd been with me a lot of these deals. She said, you got something going on? I said, only thing I can tell you is you got to get it out of the account and send it. She said, well, where am I sending it? I said, I don't have any idea. But I said, the name of the organization is TBN. Find out what the address is and get it out of my checkbook. Get that, Isaac. <laughs> Black it. I had no way of knowing, no way of knowing in a million years how I was ever going to get that back. Thirty days later, the county calls me. Mr. Doyle, do you own some land over there? There was no East Town Road yet. We're thinking about building a road over there, and we need five feet of your property. Five feet? Well, how much are you going to pay me for it? Well, we got that all worked out. We're going to pay you $18,000. I said, I'll think about it. It's just a little five-foot strip. Through about 500 feet. I thought about it. Thought about it. Thought about it some more. I went in the next morning and I told, called him and I said, I'll take 150000 Oh my gosh, you would have thought I just blew up the courthouse. These guys call me names. I use me a bottle, you know, shot a bottle. I said, not a problem. See you later. <laughs> you see, I've learned discipline. So that doesn't bother me. Three days later, Mr. Doyle, well, I thought you guys didn't want to talk to me anymore. Oh, yeah, but we, we, just, want to, we, we just want to make another offer. I said, well, what is it? Would you take 50000 No, I got it. things I learned. See, I'm walking in epigenosis. I know how to deal. I know I read about Trump doing the art of the deal. I'm the, I'm the Trump guy in Lima. But this is where he wants me. He didn't want me in New York City. But it's the same principle. Did you read that book? I read the book. I said, geez. Oh, that's what I did. I, well, I did that. Well, I did, I did that. I did that. But it's in the little things. But he had another plan for me. It's called talking to 10 men on March 18th, 2021. Good. Good. To turn their lives around.
He said, turning 10 men's lives around is a hundredfold greater than building the biggest skyscraper in the world. That's what he said to me. So I can do it. I can live with that. I don't get bogged down. Why are people coming and why are this? Because God's got the people. There'll be time. Do you know why? Because I've learned that. I was the guy walking up the mountain with the wood under my arm. I've done that. I know how to wait. I know how to be patient. Let patience have its perfect work. That you be complete and lacking nothing. I learned how to do that. I'm talking about things that's so powerful, it's greater than nuclear power. Yeah. And we just blow it off. Well, I ended up settling four hundred thousand. I let them off a little bit. So, was it worth giving one point and getting five points back? Then the Lord said to me, just as clear as I am talking to you, he said, good job, son, now go buy your heart. Thirty days, and I was thinking about well, ten years, maybe never, but I didn't care. I was believing God, and I said I'm going to do exactly what you want me to do. The rest of it is promises in here, and that's God. In the beginning was the Word; the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Got it. Got it. Got it. Who's your Isaac? Who's your Isaac? What's your Isaac? Nobody was blessed more than faithful Abraham. And guess who is? You. But you do what faithful Abraham did. And I will go over that next week. And we'll talk about the blessing to be a blessing. But it isn't going to bless you if you don't know how to be a blessing. You're just going to go scratch it out of the earth the same as everybody in the world does. And that's what your lot is in life if you don't follow what I am teaching you.